I remember just before the celebration, our first day lowered the Union Jack, which is the British flag. And we saw the flag came down, and the Bahamian flag came up. And the raising of the Bahamian flag. I tell you now, I feel the same way as I did that evening. Forty years have passed since the Bahamas got its current constitution, since we became an independent country, one people committed to building a nation. As we observe this anniversary, NB12 will take a look at what led us to July 10th, 1973, with the people who lived it the remaining framers of our Constitution. We invite you to join us for our independence special, The Independence Story, right here on Cable 12. Happy Independence, Bahamas. Good evening, Bahamas. You're tuned into NB12, broadcasting from Cable 12 Studios. Coming up tonight in news, a new Supreme Court judge questions if the Prime Minister's plan for the courts is realistic. BEC's chairman slams some local hotels and other businesses. The retired Anglican Archbishop calls SJC students' conduct outrageous. Plus, the political back and forth continues over how much government owes Bahamar. We've got those stories and so much more. I'm Bonnie Toot and NB12 starts now. Happening news tonight, Executive Chairman of the Bahamas Electricity Corporation, Leslie Miller, is warning major hotels and commercial consumers to either pay up before the summer or expect their power supply to be disconnected. He revealed the corporation is moving to clamp down on arrears. Royston Jones reports. Miller says BEC is owed millions of dollars and the corporation cannot allow hotels and other companies to remain delinquent as it does not get much money going after ordinary Bahamians who he says are struggling to make ends meet. Now the big fellas owed less who could pay. We go after them and we can go after them because they could afford to pay because you know who paid their bill? When you go to the, any hotel in this country you will see on your bill your fuel fee. In other words, the guest is paying most of that bill and the hotel parking in the damn money. So those who don't want to pay their bill, they are parking in the money from the guests and still ain't paying us. So we can deal with them over the summer. We will turn them off. Though he did not say which hotels, Miller noted that they are not the only big companies that owe considerable amounts of money. According to Miller, a road contractor owes BEC in excess of $3 million. Miller said BEC was unable to collect a penny on the millions of dollars owed by one of the country's former leading poultry firms, which closed with a debt of more than $8.5 million in 2002. He also said a hotel on Paradise Island owes in excess of $3 million. When they closed down years ago, left um, B BEC high and drive over three million dollars, but yet you're putting the pressure on the on the on the small man in this country to carry the burden. Go behind them, said who you that big damn money. They said who done gone. They said who you allowed to owe us millions and millions of dollars that you ain't gonna ever see, but yet you put the pressure on the young lady or the old man who can't afford it. That can't be right. They own this corporation. It belongs to them. So we're trying to spread the pain around so that no one carries an excess burden, that everybody pay their fair share as best they can. That's what we're going to do. Miller said the hotels faced with disconnection may use the Bahamians they employ as leverage and counter threat to lay off Bahamians. But he said there must be a shift away from that type of thinking and all customers must come to understand that what is owed must be paid. Now when we threaten to turn them off, you know what they say? We can send 100 people home. Well, why don't you try to send 100 people home and see what the end result is? Because you ain't doing us no favor. You're in this country to make money. We got to get this concept out of our head that the man come here to do us a favor. Nobody come here to do us no favor. They come here to run a profitable business. If they couldn't make money in the Bahamas, they'll go elsewhere. If they couldn't get the incentives that the government of the Bahamas has offered them and given them over the years, billions upon billions of dollars of your money, they ain't doing you no favor. 
So this thing with bending to them and bowing to them and saying, I need you because you helping us out. Of course, they're making a the contribution. But if they go anywhere, they got to hire people. They got to pay their utility bills. Ain't nobody doing you no favor. The executive chairman has pledged to work to reduce consumers' electricity bills by up to 10 percent this summer. The corporation recently launched another electricity assistance program, which Miller said has been going well, though he did not provide figures. He said many customers who signed onto the former administration's program last year and fell back into delinquency are signing onto the new program. It is estimated that around 6,000 households throughout New Providence and the Family Islands are off the grid. BEC hopes its newly restructured payment plan, coupled with reduced energy costs and payment incentives, will allow the majority of those households to be reconnected. Miller announced that its engines at his Clifton Pier power station are running at full capacity and is expected to impact energy costs, load shedding and blackouts significantly. He says the corporation is in talks with an international conglomerate about installing three 42 megawatt slow speed diesel engines at a cost of $285 million at Clifton. Reporting for MB12, I'm Royston Jones. A newly appointed Supreme Court judge is weighing in on Prime Minister Perry Christie's announcement that he would like to see up to 20 Supreme Court judges appointed. Justice Carolita Bethel, who was sworn in this afternoon, said while more judges are needed, she's not sure how realistic that is. As he wrapped up the budget debate in the House of Assembly last week, Christie told parliamentarians that cabinet would consider and bring to parliament legislation that would enable government to appoint up to 20 Supreme Court judges commencing September 2013. He said his administration's aim is to help clear up the backlog of criminal cases. However, Justice Bethel says 20 is a lot and there are certain things government has to factor in before moving forward with that ambitious plan. Certainly a lot of judges, more judges would, but you remember you have to have the prosecutors to prosecute as well. You have to have a very large jury pool if we're going to be tried by jury as well. Uh, I could see it working a little bit more if we tried uh, without a jury. That There also uh, much a large criminal bench. So there are a lot of those into play before um, 20 courts could be successful or realistic. Justice Bethel suggested it would take a lot more than 20 Supreme Court justices to increase the number of criminal cases being tried in a timely fashion. In addition to more prosecutors and a larger jury pool, she says there are also witnesses and police resources to consider. You'd have to have the witnesses available. The same police force uh, are the witnesses that have to testify, for instance. You can't have one person in a many courts at the same time. As for whether he believes it is realistic to have 20 judges, Justice Roger Gomez, who was also sworn in today, said that can be done, but it will take some time. I don't know if how it is sown or said, but I know they're trying their best to house many judges to try and cut down on the backlog. Because as you know, we have so much crime going on in the country that it's hard for the courts to keep up with the amount of cases. So the more judges you have and the more courts made available, the faster the process should be able to go on. Attorney General Allison Maynard Gibson said government hopes to have at least 10 criminal courts sitting by next year. Gomez said he and Bethel were appointed to help cut down the backlog of cases. He asked one of our main aims to try and speed up the process a bit because we are made quite aware before we appointed that this needs to be done. So that's one of our main priorities, to try and speed up the amount of cases being tried. Earlier this month, Minister of State for Legal Affairs Damien Gomez told the House of Assembly that only 89 criminal cases were tried in the past 12 months. Gomez said that figure was simply unacceptable for a system with five criminal courts. Both Gomez and Bethel will try criminal cases, but Gomez said he will handle civil cases primarily. Hi, Roger Gomez. This is Rep. Uh, we to, and we are true allegiance to our majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, our heirs and successors, according to law. So help me go I, Carolita Bethel, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me go Gomez and Bethel said they consider it a great honor to be appointed as Supreme Court judges. I'm really delighted to be here and it's really a lifelong dream come true. 
I promise that I'll do my best to serve my country and my people. I'm very happy to be a Supreme Court judge. Um, it's a new step for me. And I'm hopefully, with the help of God and a lot of hard work, I'll be a good judge. Justices Gomez and Bethel's first day on the Supreme Court bench is Monday. Guillermina Archer will be the new chief magistrate. The Anglican Diocese has remained silent since it made the controversial decision to cancel the St. John's College 2013 graduating classes prom and graduation ceremony earlier this month. But tonight, retired Anglican Archbishop Drexel Gomez is speaking out on the matter. He called students' conduct outrageous and expressed concern that legal action taken by some angry parents may negatively impact the diocese. He says it's the first time action has ever been taken against the ACEA. As a member of the church and as a former diocesan, I am very concerned about really the future of the school and the future of our involvement in education. And it's a pity that such a this conduct, which is really outrageous, has come to the center and caused such a disturbance. And, but the church in every situation has a right to express moral outrage. And in a country where there are so many young people in the country that we have to call the young people to some kind of order and help them to understand that there is behavior that is not appropriate not in private nor in public. The Anglican Central Education Authority said in a statement that it canceled the school's prom and graduation ceremony because of students' growth in subordination and deceit. School officials were reportedly offended by a YouTube video that showed students dancing through a recent school parade. Parents asserted the cancellation was a breach of contract. While not commenting on the pending court matter, Archbishop Gomez said he had hoped the situation would not reach this point. However, he noted that parents and students have a right to seek redress. Well, I just think that the whole matter is rather unfortunate, but um, when it is necessary for people to seek redress in the court, then uh, places the church in an adverse role where the church wouldn't normally want to be. But people have rights and they are entitled to, if they feel they are not being treated properly, that they have a right to seek the re redress in the courts. But uh, I would have hoped that all of that could have been avoided. In the originating summons filed by attorney Christina Galanos on June 20th, the parents of over 25 students are asking the court to order the school to host both the graduation and prom or refund the students hundreds of dollars in fees associated with both events. Gomez says he doesn't know enough about what happened to say if parents went too far, but the church must stand for standards in order to build what he called a sensible community. Parents and students do have rights, and the church has rights, and it's a question of measuring them in terms of how do you exercise discipline and how does the church make a stand and what it considers to be moral outrage and what would be the appropriate way of dealing with the outrage. There will be the issues that are at stake.